So this is uh, Sheriff Menzi, uh, also a synthetic biologist, originally from the United States, currently working in Itali Italy. And I'm very interested in your uh, opposed, or maybe not opposed, but at least alternative uh, way of dealing with it. Um, Sheriff Menzi. Uh, what we and others are attempting to do is to build life really from its pieces uh, rather than to modify existing uh, cells or existing life. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So to illustrate this, um, you know, if you were to look at a picture like this and you were asked which one of these is alive, I, I think that's a very uh, simple question and everybody would be able to identify uh, the cute little kitten as being alive, whereas the big massive uh, rock would be considered not alive. Uh, the question would then become, why? Why do you recognize that? And, and this may seem like a bizarre question, but these are the kind of questions that we often have to face when you're trying to build something from its pieces. We're trying to go from, from chemistry to a cell. We start from non-living components, and we want to make something that we would identify as living. And how do we know when we've crossed that threshold? So in an example like this, there could be a variety of reasons why somebody would tell you the cat is alive. Uh, perhaps one common reason would be, can, can you hear me by the way? Very well. <laughs> OK. Uh, one, one common reason that people may give uh, is that the cat is able to reproduce. It's able to give birth to have children. But that kind of common definition, both from the general public and from scientists, uh, has some obvious uh, problems. So for example, we can, next slide please. Uh, we can find examples in nature of organisms uh, living things that do not reproduce. This is a picture of a mule, a sterile animal. Um, but nobody would, probably nobody would argue that it's not alive. Uh, we also have human beings that are not able to reproduce. Uh, so reproduction, giving birth, is not a consistent definition of life. It does seem to be one feature that many life forms share, um, but it cannot really be used as a criterion for defining if something is alive. Uh, similarly, we can find inorganic molecules, things that, are, that we would clearly not identify as living, but could possess some traits that we could identify as living. So next slide, please. You can imagine just simple crystals. Uh, these could be protein crystals in the laboratory, but they could also be salt crystals that you find on your kitchen table. And salt crystals also can uh, replicate, in fact. So next slide, please. Uh, salt crystals are just a regular arrangement of molecules that, when broken into small pieces, can seed the growth of more crystals. Uh, so this could be viewed as a form of replication, uh, but again, I don't think anybody would claim that these salt crystals are alive. So this is just one of many examples of, of how one can try to define life and the problems that would be encountered. Uh, next slide, please. So if you were to list the kinds of things that you consider alive, uh, this perhaps would be some of the things. Uh, I don't know if it's really exactly what everybody in the audience would be thinking. Uh, but this would perhaps be some of the things people come up with, replication, reproduction, uh, birth, death, uh, which we've, we've kind of talked about just now. Uh, something that responds to its environment, responds to uh, stimuli. Uh, persistence, something that can maintain its existence over time. Uh, movement, similar to response. Uh, growth, it needs to feed, it probably releases waste. Uh, and then the last two are probably a little bit more scientific. Um, it probably possesses uh, what many of us call emergent properties. Uh, the sum is greater than its parts, and it probably uh, has processes that allow it to evolve. So each one of these kinds of characteristics uh, could probably be used in some way to describe life, but it's difficult to really find a good definition. Uh, you can find examples that support and disprove each one of these. Um, and it's not exactly clear how we can define this threshold. Uh, perhaps it needs to be a certain percentage of these properties. Um, this is something that's not clear. But these are the kind of questions that people who are trying to build cells from their pieces often have to confront. And these are different kinds of questions than I would say a typical synthetic biology project uh, that is more focused, in my opinion, or seems to me, uh, to be more focused on applications rather than really trying to uh, get at some of the deeper meanings of the function of the cell. So these sorts of um, issues, next slide please, uh, 
uh, I think also kind of illustrates the problems that we're up against. Uh, so how do you go from non-living to living? We know the pieces of a cell. We know that cells are uh, composed of DNA, of proteins, of lipids, or fat molecules. Uh, we know all of the pieces, and we can isolate all of these pieces. But the pieces by themselves are not alive. These are non-living components. So next slide, please. Should just be a big circle. <laughs> There you go. Uh, if we put those things inside of a compartment, would they assemble into a lifelike system? Uh, this sounds actually quite simple. We know the pieces of life. Can we take life apart and then put it back together? Uh, but in fact, this has never been done. Um, and why hasn't that been done if we understand biology so well? Next slide, please. Life is extremely complex, so it's not just as simple as a couple of proteins or a couple of, a couple of genes. Uh, anybody who's taken an undergraduate biochemistry course knows the complexity of metabolism. And so how do we deal with this complexity in synthetic biology? If we want to build a cell, how does one deal with this complexity? Next slide, please. I would say probably in a typical synthetic biology approach is that this complexity is ignored. You just know that it is required. You, need, you know that all of these complicated things are needed in order for something to live. So you just assume that you need it and you use it and then you build on top of it. And I would say that this is probably the typical uh, perspective in synthetic biology, which is a fantastic way of doing things. It's, it's not meant to be a criticism. Uh, this is probably the easiest way to build new function and, and to make new systems. And the example that I always like to give, uh, next slide please. Yeah, this is an older paper now, but uh, I really like it. it. It shows how you can engineer bacteria to see, or, or at least engineer bacteria to function as a, as a photographic film. Uh, so just by modifying a little bit, adding some extra genes to an existing cell, a simple bacterium E. coli, you're able to get it to respond to life, uh, or to respond to light, sorry, uh, and to take photographs to create biofuels. Uh, this is by far the best way of doing things. You're going to build a robust system. You just modify things that already exist in order to carry out the function that you want. Uh, so in, in no way am I trying to criticize that approach. All I'm saying is that sort of approach doesn't necessarily uh, get at some of the deeper complexities of a cell that some of us are interested in, and, and more specifically, some of us would like to know how do the individual molecules, or these non-living pieces, somehow assemble into something that we recognize as being alive. Next slide, please. So even the very simple bacterium E. coli, or at least we like to think of it as being simple, uh, still consists of a lot of genes. So there are over 4,000 genes in E. coli. So again, you can really see uh, the difficulty in trying to understand these sort of organisms. And if this is your goal, to build something like E. coli, you can see the difficulty in trying to understand how we can put together 4,000 components properly in order to make it alive. Uh, next slide, please. Some people, uh, such as this group in Hungary, uh, they try to remove some of these genes and they wanted to see how many of them can we get rid of and still have a living system. How much simpler can we make E. coli? And they were able to remove quite a bit. They were able to remove 15% of the genome. Uh, but nevertheless, this is still a highly complex organism. You still need close to 4,000 genes in order for this bacterium to be alive. Next slide, please. There are more simple organisms uh, on Earth. The simplest free-living organism is Mycoplasma genitalium, and this is only about 400 genes, so this is a much, much simpler system. And this is when we begin to reach a stage where we think perhaps we can fully understand how this cell functions, and this is one reason why people such as Craig Venter have chosen Mycoplasma, because of the small gene <laughs> size, and because you're beginning to reach a size which you can synthesize in the laboratory to make a synthetic genome. Next slide. But what people such as the Venter lab have done uh, is they wanted to really push this even further and again understand how few genes are needed to make the cell. And they found that they could remove about 100 of the genes. So now we're all the way down to about 380 genes. This is fantastic. This is really small. We're really getting to a manageable size. But even with this small subset of genes, 
approximately a third of these genes provide function that is unknown. There is still a lot of mystery involved in the functioning of even the most simple free-living organism that we are aware of. So I think this again really illustrates um, the kind of things that bother people like me and, and what motivates us. We want to build systems that we fully understand. We want to understand how you go from non-living to living. And even from the simplest living organisms, there's still a lot of mystery. Uh, next slide. So what is the psychology behind some of these experiments that I've talked about, so this idea of trying to find on Earth more simple organisms that we can more fully understand? And I think this comes from an evolutionary perspective that um, while I would never argue evolution is wrong, clearly uh, it's, it's not wrong, it's, it's absolutely correct. Um, I think that sometimes we think of evolution in too simplistic terms uh, and we make assumptions that are probably not true. Uh, so I think what happens a lot of these times when we look on Earth to try to find really simple organisms, at least what the scientists are thinking is they think that they are hunting for the last universal common ancestor, which is sometimes referred to as LUCA. This would be the cell that first appeared on Earth, uh, that first evolved from non-living to living uh, material. Uh, this first cell from which everything else evolved from. So the thinking is if you keep finding smaller organisms or you keep removing genes from existing organisms, then you're going back in evolutionary time, you're going to reach this most simple state that must have existed at one point in the past. So I think this is a bit of the psychology that's existing in the field. Uh, next slide, please. But I think that that's a bit simplistic. Evolution has been going on for billions of years, and it has not been going on through a linear process. It's a highly complicated process. A lot of things are happening. Genetic material is constantly being exchanged between different organisms, and it's far from being linear. So I, I particularly like this, uh, this representation of an evolutionary tree, uh, because it, it begins to show what I'm talking about. It's very difficult to trace backwards uh, to an original cell if you think of evolution as being a little bit more complex uh, than the simple previous diagram that I showed you.